By 4 p.m., McClellan chose to agree with Sumner, calling off any offensive on the main battlefield and decided to not attack Lee with his thousands of fresh blue coats, leaving Lee able to fight another day. Federal Generals George Green, who captured the Dunker Plateau earlier in that day, and the wounded Joe Hooker, whose men fought all morning, both volcanically cursed at this premature quitting. Using on McClellan's wayward thought processes to not take action, Lee's chief of artillery, Edwin Porter Alexander, later wrote, For common sense was just shouting, Your adversary is back against a river with no bridge and only one ford, and that the worst one on the whole river, if you whip him now. You destroy him utterly, root and branch and bag and baggage. Not twice in a lifetime does such a chance come to any general. Lee for once has made a mistake and given you a chance to ruin him if you can break his lines, and such game is worth great risks. Every man must fight and keep on fighting for all he is worth. But what about the one last chance for victory for the Federals? Burnside's drive was thrown back by the perfect attack by Confederate General A.P. Hill's 3,500 men arriving on their 17-mile march from Harper's Ferry, a stunning clash that stilled the carnage at last on that impossible day. As Ted Hughes, the poet, wrote, the explosives ran out, and sheer weariness supervened in what was left, looked around at what was left, and everybody wept, or sat, too exhausted to weep, or lay, too hurt to weep, and when the smoke cleared, it became clear. This has happened too often before and was going to happen too often in the future and it happened too easily. Bones were too like laugh and twigs. Blood was too like water. Cries were too like silence. The most terrible grimaces were too like footprints in mud. After dark, Lee's commanders drifted automatically back to Lee's tent and each had a private conference with him. Henry Kidd Douglas ventured out into the dark mystery of the sodden grounds where cries inside a haystack faded into mewling, then silence. The dead and dying lay as thick over the land as harvest sheaves. The pitiable cries for water and appeals for help were much more horrible to listen to than the deadliest sounds of battle. Silent were the dead, but here and there were raised stiffened arms. Heads made a last effort to lift themselves from the ground. Prayers were mingled with oaths, oaths of delirium. Men were wriggling over the earth. In the midnight, hid all distinction between the blue and the gray. My horse trembled under me in terror, looking down at the ground, sniffing at the scene of blood, stepping falteringly as a horse will, avoiding human flesh. <coughs> Afraid to stand still, hesitating to go on, his animal instinct shuddering at this cruel human mystery. 
wounded continued to overflow in Shepherdstown. When night came, we could still hear the sullen guns and hoarse, indefinite murmurs that succeeded the day's turmoil. That night was dark and lowering, and the air heavy and dull. Across the river, innumerable campfires were blazing, and we could but too well imagine the scenes that they were lighting. We sat in silence and a drawing close together, as if for comfort. We were never hopeless, yet clung with desperation to the thought that we were hoping. But in our hearts, we could not believe that anything human could have escaped from that appalling fire. On Thursday, September the 18th, the two armies lay idling, facing each other, but we could not be idle. The wounded continued to arrive until the town was quite unable to hold all the disabled and suffering. They filled every building and overflowed into the country round, into farmhouses, barns, corn cribs, cabins, wherever four walls and a roof were found together. There were six churches, and they were all full. The Oddfellows Hall, the Freemasons, the little town council room, the barn-like place known as the drill room, all the private houses after their capacity, the shops and empty buildings, the schoolhouses, every inch of space, and yet the cry was for more room. The unfinished town hall had stood in naked ugliness for many a long day. Somebody threw a few rough boards across the beams, placed piles of straw over them, laid down single planks to walk upon, and lo, it was a hospital at once. The stone warehouses down in the ravine and by the river had been passed by because low and damp and undesirable as sanitariums. But now their doors and windows were thrown wide, and with barely time allowed to sweep them, they were all occupied, even the old blue factory, an antiquated, crazy, dismal building of blue stucco that peeled off in great blotches, which had been shut for years and was in the last stages of dilapidation. Late on the 18th was almost moonless. Then a thunderstorm and Lee's discovery that morning of just how weak his army had become set cannon wheels rolling quietly down the pike, the soft shuffle of men marching at the double quick into the water at Butler's Ford. 25,000 tattered men carrying wounded and getting away. All night, Lee and Jackson stood on their horses in the Potomac River as the often clogged stream of wagons and men crossed back into Virginia and home. At 10 a.m. the next morning, General Walker passed Lee at Mid-River confirming Eddie was the last fighting force to which Lee said, Thank God. Netta Lee returns to her home of Bedford that rainy evening after caring for wounded all Thursday at Parent House in Shepherdstown. When I got back to Bedford that night, I found the house, father's office, and every vacant space full of soldiers. General Lawton had been badly wounded and with his doctor and orderlies had Brother Edwin's room in the eastern wing. In the next room was young Tom Barlow with a broken leg and his brother Jack to nurse him. Jack came with tears in his eyes and asked us to care for them. They were from Williamsburg, Virginia. My uncle, Colonel Richard Henry Lee, though not wounded, was induced by father to stay with us. Then. General Robert E. Lee's son, Rooney, had his horse fall on his leg and sprain it badly. 
He was in the little room next to General Lawton and remained a day or two. In the room next to my own was a poor fellow named Willis who began to develop typhoid fever, was ill for weeks, and died there. In my father's office in the yard, a soldier sat propped in an armchair, holding his arm which rested on his knee. There was a puddle of blood between his feet. Blood was dropping from a wound, small and not painful, but it had dropped all day. We had tried to get a surgeon to tie the artery. We feared he would die before morning. At last, Mother sent a note to dear old Dr. Quigley, our family physician. It was dark and it was raining, but he came to us with only a dim lantern to guide his footsteps. He told us he could not see to take up the artery, but thought his medicine would clot the blood and staunch it until morning. It did relieve the patient, who slept quietly all night with a friend beside him. Next day came a report that the Yankees were crossing the river and paroling all wounded whom they could not imprison. So before they reached Bedford, our young cavalryman was propped on a horse, and with his friend they hastened to the Confederate lines. They stayed at Dr. Logie's beyond Carneysville until able to travel further. Oh, those awful days. Houses searched and men arrested without cause. Mr. Davis Shepard and a company of young men became a home guard. Naturally, he was betrayed by Union sympathizers, sent to the old Capitol prison, became very ill, and returned home to die. We heard more than the usual sounds of disturbance and movement, and in the morning we found the Confederate Army in full retreat. General Lee crossed the Potomac under cover of the darkness, and when the day broke, the greater part of his force, or the more orderly portion of it, had gone on toward Carneysville and Leetown. General McClellan followed to the river on Friday morning and without crossing got a battery in position on Douglas's Hill and began to shell the retreating army and in consequence, the town. What before was confusion grew worse, the retreat became a stampede, the battery may have not done a very great deal of execution, but it made a fearful noise. It is curious how much louder guns sound when they are pointed at you than when they are turned the other way. And the shell, though no doubt less terrifying than the singing mini ball, has a way of making one's hair stand on it. The stream of fleeing soldiers on the Carneysville Pike went by Poplar Grove, the home of the Bettingers just south of Shepherdstown. And the family soon had about a hundred men on the lawn, in the house, or in their barn. Described by descendant Serena Dandridge as the intelligent, devoted angel, 40-year-old freedman Abram Dixon helped the family with the overwhelming need. When Poplar Grove was the center of such artillery shelling, and when the rest of the family was safely ensconced in the cellar, little Danska stayed behind despite the family's pleadings to join them in the room above. Finally, she closed her reading matter, R.M. Ballantyne's Coral Island, and remarked, Now I can tell my descendants that I finished a book during a battle. Someone suggested that yellow was the hospital color, and immediately everybody who could lay hands upon a yellow rag hoisted it over their house. But when the firing commenced, the hospitals began to empty. All who were able to pull one foot after another or could bribe or beg comrades to carry them left in haste. The men were described by one of their numbers as sunburnt, gaunt, ragged, scarcely at all shod, specters of caricatures of our former selves. We had fed on half-cooked dough, often raw bacon as well as raw beef, 
had devoured green corn and green apples. We had contracted diarrhea, dysentery of the most malignant type. And lastly, we were covered with vermin. Mitchell continues. In vain, we implored them to stay. In vain, we showed them the folly, the suicide of the attempt. In vain, we argued, cajoled, threatened, ridiculed, pointing out that we were remaining and that there was less danger here than on the road. The cannon were bellowing upon Douglas's Hill, the shells whistling and shrieking, the air full of shouts and cries. We had to scream to make ourselves heard. The men replied that the Yankees were crossing, that the town was to be burned, that we could not be made prisoners, but they could, and that anyhow, they were going as far as they could walk or be carried. And go, they did. Men with clothes about their heads went hatless in the sun. Men with cloths about their feet limped shoeless on the stony road. Men with arms and slings, without arms, with one leg, with bandaged sides and backs. Men in ambulances, wagons, carts, wheelbarrows. Men carried on stretchers or supported on the shoulder of some self-denying comrade. All who could crawl went and went to almost certain death. They could not go far. They dropped off into the country houses where they were received with as much kindness as it was possible to ask for. But their wounds had become inflamed. Their frames were weakened by fright and overexertion. Erysipelas, mortification, gangrene set in. And long rows of nameless graves still bear witness to the results. Our hospitals did not remain empty. It was but a portion who could get off in any manner, and their places were soon taken by others who had remained near the battlefield, had attempted to follow the retreat, but having reached Shepherdstown, could go no farther. We had plenty to do, but all that day we went about with hearts bursting with rage and shame and breaking with pity and grief for the needless, needless waste of life. Among the new arrivals from battle, Edward Moore of the 1st Rockbridge Artillery, apparently with George Bedinger and Steve Dandridge, made his way to the Bedinger home in Shepherdstown. If Dandridge was indeed president of Poplar Grove, he would not have known that within 15 years, he would marry one of its inhabitants and spend the balance of his life at this home as it would become his own. Cannoneer Moore wrote, On the following day at our hospital, the heap of amputated legs and arms increased in size until it became several feet in height. While the two armies lay face to face like two exhausted monsters waiting for the other to strike. About sundown that afternoon, I was put in an ambulance with S.E. Moore of the college company who was in a semi-conscious state, having been struck on the brow, the ball passing out back of the ear. The distance to Shepherdstown was only three miles, but the slow progress of innumerable trains of wagons and impedimenta generally converging at the one ford of the Potomac delayed our arrival until dawn the next morning. About sunrise, we were carried into an old deserted frame house and assigned to the bare floor for bets. My brother David, whose gun had remained on picket duty on this side of the river, soon found me and at once set about finding means to get me away. The only convenience available was George Bedinger's mother's carriage, 
But my brother's horse, the same brute that had robbed me of my bedding at Leesburg, now refused to work. The booming of cannon and bursting of shells along the river at the lower end of the town admonished us that our stay in the desolate old house must be short. The apprehension that they in whose wars I had borne my part would soon have all passed by made me very wretched. <laughs> As a last resort, I was lifted upon the back of this same obstreperous horse and in great pain rode to the battery, which was camped a short distance from the town. As he more was afterward taken to the Bettinger's residence, where he remained in the enemy's lines until, with their permission, he was taken home by his father some weeks later. With so many starving soldiers begging, Food became scarce at the Poplar Grove, and the family, like many, lived largely on cornbread and dried apples. We presently passed into debatable land. When we were in the Confederacy in the morning, in the Union after dinner, and on neutral ground at night, we lived through a disturbed and eventful autumn subject to continual alarms and excursions. But when this Saturday, September 20th, 1862, came to an end, the most trying and tempestuous week of the war for Shepherdstown was over. Some Comic Relief at last. A famished Confederate soldier sat down at the dinner table of a home of a family on North Princess Street near the river. When he looked down and saw on his plate more hog jaw, the fat of the hog face, he said, Well, gull dern you, Mr. Hog jaw. I'd knowed you'd anywhere, even if you were in your Sunday suit. Or, the newspaper man from the Savannah Republican newspaper in Georgia, knocking on the door of the house near Shepherdstown, with a menacing black flag waving out front. He wrote, an elderly lady appeared at the door as soon as our footsteps sounded on the doorway and relieved our doubts. She was tall, stout, red-headed, with a firm look and carried in her hand a bright barrel pocket revolver. She asked what we wanted and we answered, water. Very well, she said. Do you see that? Pointing to the flag. We answered in the affirmative. That means no quarter. And this, pointing to the revolver, is to shoot the first man that goes into that yonder cabbage patch. Or the antics of John Opie and Briscoe Ranson from the 6th Virginia Cavalry. Seeing a flag of truce and some men crossing the river, they rode down to the ford. The men were carrying a quart bottle of eight-year-old whiskey meant for Colonel Tom Rosser from Federal General Van Horn, who knew him at West Point. When asked, we magnanimously accepted the whiskey for delivery. Then Opie wrote, We stuck spurs into our horses and charged the atmosphere towards camp. The lieutenant and his men, having no firearms, could only raise their tuneful voices and shout and swear at us. When we reached the forks of two roads, one leading to the camp and the other to Charlestown, we concluded to take the latter as by going into camp we would be interrupted in our praiseworthy design of destroying Rosser's whiskey. We then proceeded 
but presently we began to entertain grave and serious doubts as to the road. We discussed this question with great verbosity until we arrived in front of a large white house located in a beautiful grove of native oaks, running from which to the road was a straight tan bark walk. We halted and hallowed two or three times when presently there appeared on the walk and leisurely sauntered down to the old-fashioned style a great strapping red-headed man who evidently was not at Sharpsburg. What do you want? said he. I want to know where this road goes, my friend, said I. This road don't go anywhere, he replied. I sternly said to the man who had evidently read the Arkansas Traveler and desired to play it on us, I have asked you where this road goes and I want a polite answer. I have been living here, sir, for twenty years, and this road has not gone anywhere yet," was his reply. I drew my self-cocking six-shooter, and I suppose from my not cocking it, this rustic not being aware that it was unnecessary, was not in the least alarmed, for he replied, You damned fool, you! I just told you that I've been living here for twenty years, and this road has not gone anywhere yet. My patience having become exhausted, I raised my pistol, and looking the impudent rascal in the eyes, I deliberately fired at an imaginary object about three feet from his left ear. This was more than the Arkansas traveler could stand, so he whirled, and as he whirled, I again fired, and no kangaroo ever made leaps in the air as did that terrified citizen. Off like a rocket, up the walk he ran, darkening the atmosphere with tan bark while I fired salute after salute in order to increase his velocity. On the porch was a fat red-headed girl, working her right arm up and down like a pump handle, jumping about in a frantic manner, shouting at the top of her voice, Run, Pap! Run, Pap! Ranson and I were laughing ourselves into hysterics when finally Pap fell against the porch, and breathless from exhaustion and fright, he managed to gasp, Bring me my rifle here, Sal. Bring me my rifle. Sal disappeared into the house when I, observing to Ranson that he would shoot to kill, we hastily galloped away. Some wounded rebels did not get back to Virginia soil. The innovative medical director of the Federal Army, Jonathan Letterman, reported afterward, in addition to our own wounded, we had to care for 2,500 Confederate wounded from the Battle of South Mountain, Crampton's Cap, and Antietam. Those in houses progressed less favorably than those in barns, those in barns less favorably than those in open air, although all were in other respects treated alike. With wounded from both sides on both sides of the river, Dr. Abner Hard led a covert advance with an Illinois regiment that surrounded Shepherdstown and its surprised inhabitants. Confederate officers were taken prisoner, and Dr. Hart also recovered federal wounded to bring back to Maryland, and they also rounded up Edwin Gray Lee, who was visiting his parents at Bedford, and he was released a few days early in October in a prisoner exchange. 
Bernard wrote, Friday, September 26, 1862, Ascending the hill through a deep ravine, the body of a soldier was discovered, too much decomposed to be recognized. Near the village, we encountered the rebel pickets who beat a hasty retreat, but our movements were ordered and executed so quickly and with such celerity that the village was surrounded and occupied before many were aware of our presence. The place had the appearance of one immense hospital, nearly every house being filled with wounded, which had been taken from the Battle of Antietam. Among them were some Union prisoners which we provided for with great pleasure. We also drove the enemy some three miles beyond the town and took about 30 prisoners. Among them, Lieutenant Colonel Lee of the 33rd Virginia Infantry. He was finally mounted and equipped and expressed himself greatly chagrined at being captured. Toward evening, the regiment returned to camp with their prisoners proud of their day's work. On Sunday, the 28th, our newly appointed chaplain, Reverend Philo Judson, arrived and preached his first sermon. Monday, September 29th, a reconnaissance in force was made, General Pleasanton commanding. Colonel Farnsworth, being unwell, our brigade was under the command of Colonel Williams of the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry. Halting for a short time at Shepherdstown, our wounded men were conveyed across the river in small boats and sent to Sharpsburg. While engaged in the discharge of this duty, we observed those in charge of the hospital near the river took special pains to prevent our going around a certain house. Our suspicions were aroused and thinking there might be some soldiers secreted there, one of the officers of the regiment was made aware of the facts. He at once instituted a search Though strenuously opposed by the family, no soldier was found, but a fine cavalry horse with full equipments was discovered in a cave in the hill, which made an excellent addition to our own animals. A few miles further on at a farmhouse we found Colonel McGill and other rebel officers suffering from severe wounds. The colonel had an arm amputated at the shoulder which for want of proper care was alive with maggots. After dressing their wounds, we learned that the colonel had been educated at West Point and was a classmate of General Pleasanton. Friday, October 3rd, 1862, Henrietta Bettinger Lee writes her daughter, Ida Rust, in Loudoun County. Your dear letter came safely yesterday. It was a balm and comfort to my tired mind and weary body. Your dear father returned from his exile about two weeks since when our army passed into Maryland. Oh, what a time we have had with that army. The fight near Sharpsburg filled our town to overflowing with wounded and dying men. Every vacant house, every church, and nearly all the private homes have been full. I had 11, and with their attendance, 16. Now I am sitting by your father's sickbed. For a week he has been quite ill with typhoid. Yesterday his fever left him, but in spite of all our entreaties, he would get up and he would eat some cheese. The consequences were a horrid night and more fever. I am verily nearly worn out with anxiety and watching. Oh, added to this, a sad case upstairs. A young man who's been ill since the battle. He was badly wounded. Then typhoid set in. And now, for several days, he has been in a dying condition. He cannot survive this day. I have another young man in Eddie's room who's doing well, though he was badly wounded. The others were removed to Winchester though many were utterly unfit to go. The shells passed over the east wing of Bedford, trimming the trees in the garden and scaring old Kizzy, who was digging the cabbage bed, out of her senses. 
Seven of the shells were picked up unexploded. Oh, how many desolate homes, orphaned children, and widowed mothers has this vile, cruel, and oppressive war caused. Your dear brother came from a bed of sickness in Lexington to see us last Thursday. I had not seen him since last spring. The Yankees were informed of his visit by this vile old Abram Snyder, whom he met in the road. They surrounded the house, captured him and his pet horse, which had been stolen, and to recover which, he had that day to pay $75. Dr. Hard's regiment came looking for officers while Edwin Gray Lee was sitting on the portico of Bedford using field glasses. His younger sister, Netta Lee, was about to go to town to buy some hops to make a hops pillow for her sick father. Getting word of approaching Yankees, Edwin rushed to the stables, saddled his horse, and fled across the field in the direction of Morgan's Grove. Unfortunately, he got into the swamp where the Federals surrounded him and captured him. Henrietta Lee continues, Edwin was paroled, but his horse, revolver, and saddle were taken from him. He's with us now, but expects to leave tomorrow in order to be exchanged. Poor fellow. Old Jenny, which he hired as a cavalry horse, was also stolen the night before last, or rather captured, as his rider was in a house in town and a Yankee came along and took the horse off. I have not been in town for nearly two weeks. Two wounded men died at the rectory last week, and Lila has been sick, but is recovering. Annie did not get to stay those days with me. The days she arranged to come, all the wounded were brought in. She is well and her little children very sweet. Tippy spent the day here on Wednesday. She is as precious and lovely as she can be, and I think the young captain she has taken a fancy to thinks far more of himself and his promotion than of her. He is very full of himself, that is certain. Tippy always speaks most lovingly of you and wishes she could see you and be near you, as who does not. No tyrant of the old world ever displayed greater despotism. Is it not sad that so many of our poor wounded should be in such hands as Federal Provost Marshal? Heaven shield us from their grasp. Sue writes as if she hoped you would come and spend the winter with her, but there's still so much uncertainty. I supposed you have not yet decided. It is thought that Mary Dare Perrin has made a conquest of a Dr. Tindley who is here attending the sick and wounded. I can't say much for her taste. He's staying at her mother's, is from Williamsburg and an acquaintance of Edwin's. He dined with us, but he did not take my eye. I could fill several sheets with interesting accounts of our wounded and sick soldiers. But I do say, if we have had a specimen of the way the physicians treat those poor men throughout our southern land, it is no wonder they die in scores. It seems to me this war has crushed our humanity from the hearts of men. Oh, that it might please God to end it and give us back our loved ones to our homes and hearts again. I could amuse you by the hour with some items, especially I wish I could transcribe a note I got from a gentleman during our season of confusion and nursing. It was a rare note to send a lady. The last of Carrie's wounded left a week ago. Colonel Calhoun of South Carolina and like the one who left us, he parted with tears and sobs. Poor fellow. I could have wept with him. But darling, my paper is nearly exhausted. I fear I will find this rather bulky for my envelope. I will squeeze it in. Thank dear Mr. Armistead for his kind, sweet letter. This must answer his and yours as I have a scarcity of paper in the envelopes kiss him and the precious boy and little Becky. My heart is pining to see you all. 
God our Father bless and keep you all for Jesus' sake. Ever your loving mother. P.S. I have no strength or wish to read this over. Let no eye see it and destroy it as soon as you read. Earlier on Monday, September 22nd, President Lincoln had given the bloodbath that was here a reason with his most lasting action, the announcement and later signing into law of the Emancipation Proclamation, making the carnage at Antietam part of a war for the freedom of the enslaved. A young nation would continue killing itself for issues so divided and hopeless, many entrusted solutions to providence alone. The war would rage down its long, dusty path for 30 more months, leaving this nation with a deep, everlasting, contemplative scar. And some were nobly saved to the last best hope of Earth.